Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. I'm Sam Stegman. Um, I'm going to welcome you. I'm welcoming you to the welcomer. Uh, the, the welcome this morning. Uh, it's going to come from Marcos Morero. Uh, I want to just introduce him. Marcos um, was working at the, uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission a few years ago when he first joined the uh, PV Grows Steering Committee. So I got to work with him in that uh, in that role for a couple of years, and um, it was our loss, but um, the community's gain when uh, when he left that that position and, and the steering committee. He went to be we have the next slide, Caitlin. So I get it right. Um, he's the economic development and planning director for the city of Holyoke. He was invited to, into this role by uh, the incoming mayor Alex Morse at the time. And so I just say that we are lucky to have um, a person who understands um, and is committed to and advocates for a healthy food system and all that that means um, in a role like this. So please welcome us, Marcos. Good morning. I am definitely the person that is uh, listed up there. Uh, I'm Marcos Marrero. Uh, thank you to PB Bros, uh, Sam and Javiera for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to welcome you all this morning. Uh, as a former board member, it's uh, great to be uh, before all of you and just getting to see most of the people I don't see anymore because I'm uh, out in my planning and economic development cave or in other events. Uh, so it's nice to see you all. Uh, welcome to Holyoke and this beautiful mill space that is Open Square. Uh, you know, you're stepping into the city in a really important time of, uh, of Holyoke's evolution. Uh, we're known as a paper city, uh, but a place that uh, a few years ago stopped relying on paper to create its jobs and drive its economy. Uh, we're not like many other industrial cities uh, in the United States where, where industry has as uh, its driving industry has, has moved on. Uh, and uh, places that have to uh, look for what, is the, what are the new things that are gonna come to drive its economy and its communities. We're in an economy that no longer is gonna rely for the most part on just one type of industry to, to make its jobs grow, uh, one type of industry to create its, its tax revenue. Uh, the current jobs are being defined now. They're being defined today in conversations like these and informed like these. You know, with the coming of the, uh, of the Massachusetts Green Computing Center, uh, you know, one example of, of how, we're, how this city has, has, has started looking at new ways of, of creating jobs. Uh, the Computing Center came in and it really forced us to look at uh, how do we drive innovation, not just through university research, which is what primarily drives the Computing Center, but in all facets of our local economy, right? So, uh, one example of that was, okay, now we have this great computing center, can we take its waste heat and, and create uh, a commercial greenhouse, right? Now, unfortunately, the computing center was so green, it, it didn't produce as much, uh, uh, as much heat as, as uh, we would have liked, right, to, so that we could use the waste. Well, no, not enough waste there. But, uh, you know, that's not meant to be disheartening. It's uh, meant to say that there are challenges in the way, and I'm sure uh, you'll, you'll all be discussing those in, in your forums later this morning. But the intent is still there, right? Uh, we're still interested in, 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 in pursuing uh, new ways of uh, food. Oh, I'll be done way before three minutes from now. I'm already on my way. Uh, we're still interested in ways of exploring new, uh, new ways of, of producing food, and of course, uh, new ways of uh, in, in our revitalization strategies, right, addressing the food desert or the food swamp issues uh, that, that afflict uh, su uh, several neighborhoods uh, in the city, uh, and how to do that you know, justly and fairly uh, with new jobs. So, this conference uh, topic is timely, of course, and critical for the framework of not just the city of Holyoke, but cities like us and regions like us. Your discussions today will lead to a better understanding of uh, what we're facing in the, in the, food, uh, in the food world. And I definitely welcome uh, the ideas that come out of here. So again, I want to welcome uh, you, welcome your ideas, and welcome this conference to Holyoke. And uh, fun times. Have fun today. All right. Um, welcome again. Thanks for coming out on this gorgeous day. Um, 
and uh, this space, I love this space, and um, there are uh, over 100, maybe 130 of us to here today. We're going to be in this space all day, so I always like to start out with just encouraging people to um, embrace the closeness, embrace the noise, um, use the outdoor spaces uh, as, we, as we do breakouts and things, if, if, if that's feasible. Um, and um, I just want to appreciate you all for, for coming out, and I want to appreciate also our sponsors for, for helping make this a free uh, and accessible event. There are little plaques around with, our, with, the, with the logos of our 26 sponsors. Um, and along with that, um, our, the, the food that is here um, is, um, we'll hear more about the food that's here. Um, you are welcome and invited to make a donation to cover food costs. We, we welcome that, um, but it's also optional. Um, and I think that's the sort of logistical stuff I want to I want to cover. Um, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Sam Stegman. I work at CESA, Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture, um, and CESA uh, takes in the funding for PV Grows um, and hosts and staffs PV Grows, uh, which is a an independent network. I, I kind of do this spiel at the beginning of each each forum. Um, raise your hand if this is the first PV Grows forum you've been to. Right, so that's about, like, usually it's about half the people, which is great, in my opinion, we get this consistency and this new influx of energy. Um, so um, the network is just that. It functions like a professional network, in my opinion, although you don't need to be paid doing some kind of paid food system work to be involved. Um, if you're dedicated to creating a healthy food system in the Pioneer Valley, um, please participate. Um, the networking is a piece of these events, which we're now doing once a year. We have had done them twice a year, so this is the sixth or seventh, I think, of these. We're trying to build in more networking. This one's going to be a little looser in the afternoon than usual in terms of um, less structure and more networking time. Um, and I encourage you to reach out to people that you don't know. Um, the learning piece is uh, a lot in these forums. We take on a different topic or issue each forum. Um, I just want to make clear that we don't do follow-up. This is like a one-off event on an aspect of the food system. Last time it was farm to institution, before that it was food security, um, before that it was entrepreneurship. Um, because we're a network, we don't do programs, we just spur you to learn about and interact on an issue so that you can do your work better in your community, in your organization. Um, and then the last is, there is an action piece, and it takes the form of working groups. So I'll talk about those a little more. A working group is where you find like-minded people that you want to work together with. Uh, who we are, PD Growth now has 900 members. It's free to be a member. Uh, that's in the past five years. Um, and um, on the, there's two sides. There's this network side, and then there's the uh, food business, which includes farms, financing, uh, which I'll talk more about. Um, stop, yeah, pause right there. The, on the network side, about 400 people have come to these forums of those 900 members. Um, we have a 13-person steering committee that puts this all together. On the food business financing side, we have a 14-person 14, 14 working group that, um, that does the PV growth, coordinates the PV growth loan fund. Um, so the working groups on the network side, if you could go forward, um, race in the food system, you'll hear more about their upcoming event, uh, job creation, land, and higher education. Um, and then working groups on the finance side include slow money and entrepreneurship, which I just put it up there. It doesn't exist yet, but I really wanted to. So, not just me, but a lot of people have expressed an interest in it. Um, the numbers there is, is the number of people who've expressed an interest kind of signed up for those working groups. Some working groups have the PV Grows Loan Fund is a, is a project that started as a working group four and a half years ago and has met every single month for all that time. Other working groups have been one 45 minute lunch conversation and then never gone any further. Um, so that's kind of like the pieces that we do. Um, I just want to say that I said we, we're a network and we don't do programs and that's not totally not true. We in fact do one program, which is this loan fund. Okay, the, the last from, from me is that um, the vision um, in a network, I think you can't get everybody to agree on stuff, um, and you shouldn't try, but if there's a general shared vision, that's the cohesion of the network. So, um, vibrant farms and gardens, justice and fairness, healthy people, 
sustainable ecosystems, thriving local economies, and strong communities. This is, these are six indicators of a healthy food system. It comes from the Whole Measures for Community Food Systems report, and we've essentially adopted it. I've shown it in every forum I've been to, and no one's ever disagreed with it, so. It's too late. <laughs> um, and then, um, so I'm going to leave that slide up, and I'm going to pass it off to Javiera Benevente. Um, and I just want to say, before I do that, I have to sing her praises because um, she, um, I've gotten to work with her a number of times over the years and have, from the very start, said I would love to work with her in, in, in a more day-to-day -day way, and I've gotten to on this forum. Um, she's joined the PV Grows team, she's put together this event, all the presentations, all the, the content, and all the logistics. She's done a heroic job and humbled me greatly um, because she actually got a good sleep last night, whereas I never did before. <laughs> And I did what she's doing. Um, but I've just I've learned so much from her over the years about facilitation and leadership and listening and all those things. So thank you and welcome. I'm a little bit shorter than Sam. Um, thank you, Sam. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, this forum has been several months in the making, and it's just a real pleasure to see all of you here um, coming together to dig into this really important topic that we're going to be uh, really digging into today, which is the hands that feed us good food and good jobs in the Pioneer Valley. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about why we chose this theme and how we chose this theme. Um, Back in the fall, when the PV Grow Steering Committee started thinking about what the theme for this year's forum should be, uh, I actually wasn't a part of those conversations, but I've been hearing about it. Um, one of the topics of interest that emerged was job creation in the local food system, um, which is something that we're really committed to. And as we were discussing that, um, our shared commitment to workers' rights, equity, and justice um, around those jobs emerged as an area that we thought was really, really important. And it was rooted in an understanding that we don't just want to create more local food jobs, we want those jobs to be good jobs for workers. And they aren't always, so it's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, and these, this really quickly became the primary focus of the forum because we recognize that these issues, if left unattended to, um, will keep us from creating a truly healthy food um, and that's one of the commitments that we have with these forms is really to, to highlight and illuminate issues that, um, if left unattended to, will keep us from doing what we want to do, which is create a healthy food system. So we really try to tackle the issues that are hard to tackle, that haven't been discussed or talked about before, and um, that maybe have remained kind of on the sidelines or in the shadows. The six indicators of a healthy food system that Sam mentioned in many ways serve as a guidepost for our work. Um, and they also serve as a way to assess where we might be falling short. Um, so while these forums have become a place where we come together to celebrate successes, they've also become a place where we come to shed light on what's keeping us from fulfilling the promise of a healthy food system, as I mentioned before. Um, so what do we mean by good jobs? Good jobs really, I think, mean different things to different people, but we've identified three components that make up good jobs. And they're broad, um, and, and we can have discussion about you know, the specificity of them today, but they include fair wages, quality working conditions, and workers having a say in their workplace. We really feel like those are three really important components that make up a good job. And of course, creating these kinds of jobs isn't easy. It's actually quite challenging and often a struggle. Um, but one of the things that I take inspiration from and that makes me feel hopeful is the work that's happening nationally that food workers are leading um, to make food work more visible and also um, to build a growing movement for fair wages and just working conditions within the food system and really specifically within the industrial food system. Um, and some of the organizations doing this work are the Food Chain Workers Alliance, the Restaurant Opportunities Council Center, and the Coalition for Immokalee Workers. And if you're not familiar with those organizations and their work, I really encourage you to check them out online. So that's some
some work that's happening nationally. Um, but I want to say that, you know, that said, there are some really particular challenges facing local food businesses and the local food system when it comes to creating good jobs. It's not easy to compete with the industrial food, with industrial food businesses and produce high quality food at relatively affordable prices and pay yourself and your workers a livable wage. Um, some might believe that we have to choose, either have good food or have good jobs, but the truth is that we need both, and I firmly believe that both are possible. So I'm just going to wrap up by saying that um, what we're trying to achieve here in terms of creating good food jobs, both good food and good jobs, is possible, and it's possible when we come together and have the courage to look at these issues in all their complexity to talk honestly with one another about our successes, about our failures, about our challenges, and about our differences. And it's possible when we come together to learn about what's been working and what's not been working from those who are at the front lines of making this happen. And that's what we're here to do today, to begin a conversation about how we can create good food jobs in the Pioneer Valley. Thank you. Just review, I wanna just, um, give you all a little bit overview of the, the day and talk about a few logistics. Um, this is the agenda for the day and the way that it will flow. Uh, we have a couple of keynotes coming up and then um, we're gonna have a little interactive activity followed by a panel discussion. And then we're gonna have some, some small breakout groups where folks are gonna get to dig into the various aspects of this topic. Um, and then we're gonna close and have lunch. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it to Alex Risley Schroeder, who's going to be talking about uh, specifically job creation in the Pioneer Valley. Um, I'm with the Massachusetts Workforce Alliance, um, and we, through our local food, local jobs research, identified strong regional food systems as an area with potential to create jobs. And we asked, where will the jobs be, what kinds, and what preparations necessary to build a ready, skilled workforce for these jobs. Um, these questions are really informing our work, um, including as one of the organizations that's working on the Massachusetts State Food Plan process. And they also inform our participation in this network. Right now, um, I want to talk about food jobs in our valley. And I want to talk about cautious optimism, intention, and powerful cross-cutting alliances. I want to frame our consideration today of the hands that feed us. So when we think about food and how it gets onto our plates, we might think about farmers, truck drivers, cashiers, we might think about someone preparing the food for us. But this thinking is akin to the thinking that the lights go on because of a switch on the kitchen wall. We're skipping over some of the essential steps involved in getting food from field to greenhouse to plate. And each of those steps that it takes to get food to our plate um, involves someone, right? And in a local food system, it involves someone we might know, someone we could know, someone we might want to know. And the thinking is that by eating more that's produced here and processed here, we can create jobs. I want to give you some perspective on this. Mass Workforce Alliance in our research and interviews with Valley Food System businesses affirms that job creation potential exists. Michael Schumann in his analysis, which you um, had a link to his report and the invitation and publicity for this, indicates that 25% shift towards food localization um, would create 4,030 new jobs. For a workforce development person, that's an exciting number. I hope you're excited too. Um, I also want to say, but, but be cautious here. These are the jobs that are possible. Not necessarily all of them are plausible. And that has to do with a range of constraints, including land, training, um, investment, and things like that. However, with that caution, I'm going to give you a scan of where those jobs might be. And think about which ones you anticipated and which ones might be surprising to you. So if there's land and training available, 
It could be there's uh, new jobs in raising and slaughtering animals, like pigs, sheep, goats, cattle, poultry. There's also egg production jobs. Um, there's a potential for new farming jobs, growing fruit, vegetables, and grains, raising nursery stock, including trees and plants. And there are also jobs in agricultural support activities, think compost, think anaerobic digestion. And local food could also create food manufacturing jobs, frozen food, baked, and canned products. And there's a potential for a large number of jobs raising dairy cattle, and the value-added work that comes, can come with that, manufacturing milk, butter, and ice cream, and with additional demand, potential food service jobs. Show it to me again. All right. Um, also, if we look north to Vermont, which sometimes we do, right? And they're a little ahead of us on some of this. We can see that intention can be a powerful catalyst in job creation. Vermont has, in the past four years, been able to create 2,162 food jobs, food system jobs. Don't you love the specificity there? Um, and I hear that it might be higher, but it's hard to keep track. Um, and Vermont's initial estimates were 1,500 jobs to be created over 10 years. And I've heard them say that the act of making a plan and connecting and strengthening the food system through that planning process catalyzed job creation, and that they were able to exceed their initial estimates. So here, in our valley, we have um, good plans. We have the Pioneer Valley Plan, raise your hand, David. We have the Franklin Regional Council of Governments, Mary's over there, and many of you participated in the development of those. We have focused intention. We have invested stakeholders, including all of you in this room. And th this is good and this is hopeful. More local food can mean more local food jobs. But as much as we can be and should be hopeful, we must also be three things, discerning, critical, and active. Just because the food comes from here does not mean that the jobs are good jobs, that they're paying fair and living wages. And in many instances, local food jobs in our valley are part-time or seasonal jobs with a great deal of uncertainty for workers. And that's a big misstep in our food system. I want to give you a few more examples of missteps. This is not an exhaustive list. but. We have a diversity of agricultural workers, ranging from migrant workers to college-educated workers, and each one has a different set of needs that need to be addressed. Um, and we know that we'll need more well-qualified workers for agricultural production. So we're going to have to figure out how to address those needs and do so meaningfully. We lack clear, well-articulated, and accessible pathways that allow and support people to come in at an entry level and advance um, to positions with more responsibility. And the available training isn't always a good fit. And then as we relocalize, training needs to change in response to that. We have regulations, like Department of Labor regulations and municipal health codes, that can constrain business efficiency as well as business innovation, both key components of a functioning food system. So what can we do? What are we doing to address these missteps? Today you're going to hear a lot um, but the thing I'd like to point you most towards as you listen is that one of the most vital things is that we're making and using alliances that bring workers and employers together, that bring food system builders and advocates together. And these are strategic, focused efforts to address issues that confront workers and employers. But I don't want you to be fooled, because what makes these alliances powerful is their potential to strengthen and improve relationships between local businesses and the local people they will employ. And that's the key. So my charge today was to communicate cautious and practical optimism. And so let me sum that up. Yes, we can create local food jobs, but we must be very careful and pay attention to the hands that feed us. So thank you. I'm happy to turn the mic over to Urban Crowell, who's the executive director of the Neighboring Food Co-op Association, and he's going to set this conversation about the hands that feed us in a larger context. And we're incredibly fortunate to have him here with us. And he, he's connected to us and was part of the early efforts around establishing this fine network. So thank you. Good morning. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, yeah, my name is Urban Kroll. I'm executive director for the Neighboring Food Co-op Association. I was also a staff person for the Cooperative Fund of New England. I don't know if there's a rep here today when these dialogues were first getting started. And I see a lot of that. a lot of the same folks in the room. It's great to see you all and have a chance to talk with you all today. Um, 
My background uh, might be described as an obsession with cooperatives. I serve on the board of the National Cooperative Business Association. I'm teaching a course at the University of Massachusetts now in the cooperative movement. We've also got some great panelists today and other people in this room, so I'm trying to figure out in my presentation how to steer a little bit in a different direction and offer some thoughts on this question. What I want to get at is some of these questions about resilience of businesses. If we're going to be able to create strong local jobs that create good opportunities for working people, how are they going to survive over time? You know, and some of the first questions here, I know this sounds kind of straightforward, but for a job to be good, it first actually has to exist. <laughs> um, you know, and for a job to exist over the long term, it's got to be resilient. One way to strengthen resilience is the loyalty of the stakeholders in a community towards supporting that business over time. One of the best ways to create loyalty is to ensure that they have some kind of ownership and participatory stake in that business. And finally, what I would say is that same core lesson can also be applied to dialogues like this around what good jobs are, what they can be. How can we engage people in a way that they feel included and empowered and have a stake in the outcomes of those discussions? So where I come to this question from, I spent about 10 years working with a worker cooperative called Equal Exchange, and our focus was on creating more fair trade relationships between the global north and the global south. Um, worker cooperatives connecting with food cooperatives to try to create more fair trade relationships for producers and workers in the developing world. Over time, that, you know, that work was extremely inspiring for me, but over time what became more and more apparent to me was those same power relationships we were seeing internationally and trying to resolve had very strong parallels right here in our own country, in our own backyard. And I started working with Equal Exchange to try to create what we call a domestic fair trade uh, program to try to address some of these uh, issues in collaboration with producers. And I just wanted to share probably one of the most profound experiences I had was working in Georgia in the South with African American farmers. This is Cornelius Key, who's an organizer with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which might be described as sort of the economic wing of the civil rights movement. It's a history that is, has largely been lost, but African American communities in the South used credit unions, worker co-ops, farmer co-ops as their primary leverage against a power system that was locking them out. It's an extremely inspiring story, a challenging story, and it's one that continues. And that brought me to an even stronger sense of the potential of cooperatives in terms of empowering working people in their daily lives. This presentation could have been all about that history. In fact, <clears throat> I had to work hard to steer away from that. But as, if, as I've been teaching at the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts on the history of co-ops, the, the role of working people in creating a totally different working model in the Industrial Revolution is deeply inspiring. It was union activists, it was working people who formed the first food co-ops, the first farmer co-ops, the credit unions, many of which are still in operation in our valley today, were formed by working people. And I could talk about that all day, but maybe that's a discussion for another time. And uh, I want to try to stay focused on the question before us now. What's the relevance of this model now? So to steer back to this question of enterprise resilience, right? If we're trying to build strong local jobs, good jobs, one of the key questions we've got to address is how those jobs are going to survive over time. One of the obsessions of, of mainstream business literature today is on this question of loyalty especially in the wake of the global recession. If you look at how much, uh, how hard businesses have to work to maintain customer loyalty, worker loyalty, the loyalty of investors, and the impact of negative relationships on the performance of the enterprise and its ability to pay workers well is profound. <laughs> And when people looked at cooperatives in the context of the global recession, what they found was co-ops were actually performing much better than other types of business. But what the crucial ingredient was, was the ability of co-ops to leverage the, the loyalty of their members, whether they be consumers, workers, producers, into the success of that business over time, particularly during a down economy. 
And what this translates into is stronger enterprise resilience over time. The people in the community feel committed to that business, they feel empowered by that business, they feel heard by that business, and in the context of a challenging economic situation, they are more likely to either work harder for that business, or shop there, go out of their way to shop there, or in the case of producers, ensure that that business is getting their best products moving forward, because that is the way to root that infrastructure in the community. Many of you might have heard about the International Year of Co-ops in 2012. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about co-ops a lot, but I'm talking about this question of resilience through cooperatives. And what I think is significant about this is that, you know, the UN didn't shine a light on co-ops because of the word co-ops. They shined a light on this business model because in the wake of this recession, when jobs were being lost at, at an incredible rate, people were losing their homes, working people were losing their life savings. There was a business model that was surviving, and it was surviving through the participation of its key stakeholders. And so the dialogue that they wanted to raise was not simply about this specific model, but how the question of participation can be built into dialogues across the economy. Now, co-ops ourselves have not been that great at telling this story ourselves. Um, but in 2008, uh, the food co-ops here in the Valley of Western New England actually hired an independent researcher to take a look at the impact that we were having. Um, Alex mentioned Vermont. You know, our food co-ops are extremely strong in Vermont, and if you took them together, they would actually be among the top 25 employers in the state. You know, that's a statistic that none of us realized before we commissioned the study. If you think about the questions of good jobs that Javier raised, you know, if you look at tenure, if you look at workplace participation, if you look at wages, um, if you look at staff turnover, if you look at pay ratios, in all of those areas, these cooperatives performed very, very well and much better than we might have thought. The point I want to raise there, I should also point out in terms of sustaining other local businesses. So here you've got locally rooted businesses that make a priority of buying from other local businesses. So these co-ops together purchased over 30 million in local products. So they're leveraging their buying power to sustain other businesses. What I want to emphasize is this, this uh, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me and say, therefore co-ops are perfect. Therefore, we've got it all figured out. In fact, what this study did more than anything was raise questions on how we could do better, how we could balance these issues with buying local, with being more sustainable. Um, so more than anything, it continued to shine a light on what we could do better in terms of serving our local communities. To bring this to this larger dialogue, you know, again, what I'm trying to get at is the power of these business models is the engagement of key stakeholders, workers, consumers, producers, in the long-term viability of that business in terms of how it serves its community, how it could serve its community, what its mission is moving forward. In my last couple of years at Equal Exchange, I had the chance to work with this uh, group called the Domestic Fair Trade Association, which um, was trying to take these lessons from the international fair trade movement and understand how they could be applied domestically and locally. And I think one of the most powerful things we were able to do there was to pull together a broad group of the stakeholders in that system. You know, whether you're talking about farmers and producers, retailers, processors, NGOs, and I would say most critically, farm workers and workers in the food system. And what was most inspiring about that process is that up until that point, a lot of these groups had never been asked to have a seat at the table in defining what it was we meant by fair trade, by good jobs. And I think that there was an assumption at the time that this would be challenging, like you couldn't put all of these competing interests in one room and come up with viable solutions. But I, th I think if you look at the principles that PV Grows is trying to work by, some of the principles that Javier uh, mentioned, you can see them reflected in the principles that came out of this, this initial working group, this steering committee of stakeholders across the food system in terms of fair prices for producers, fair wages for workers, sharing of risk and reward, 
Ownership is something I would love to see more at the fore in terms of thinking about the potential of workers' engagement in good jobs. Not always being in a position of asking for better wages or having some say, but actually being at the table as owners, um, as participants in the success of that enterprise. And part of what we wanted to do is figure out how you institutionalize that dialogue moving forward. And so this slide is sort of my thumb in the eye of every PowerPoint seminar I've been to that says what you're not supposed to do with a PowerPoint slide. But <laughs> the, point, the point is that this is the diagram that I presented to this group when we were deciding to incorporate on what I thought governance of this organization could look like. And it institutionalized the representation of each of these groups, not just by saying, hey, we've got a seat here for you. Each of these groups appoints their reps, right? So the farm workers organizations in this group say who they want to represent them in this dialogue. And I think initially there was a lot of fear among the different stakeholder groups that what might happen was each of those groups was going to put forward their most contentious leaders, right? Their leaders most able to fight for their perspective. And this is not what happened. Invariably, these groups would get together and they would think about the representatives they want, that they wanted at the table, and when they appointed their reps, there was almost universal excitement among the boards on who was there at that table. And I don't want anyone to get this wrong, that is not because everybody at the table disagreed. It was that all of these very, very challenging issues were on the table, and they felt they had the right people in the room to advocate for those issues and try to come up with solutions that treated all the stakeholders as, as equal participants in the outcome. So if, if um, as you all move forward and think about the dialogue around good, good food, good jobs, and PV grows, I'd love it if you took a look at the principles that this group came up with and see how they match up with the end point that you're trying to get at. So where I wanted to wrap up was just back to that initial question that I was raising. If what we want is good food jobs that survive over time, I feel like we really need to wrestle openly and honestly with these questions of ownership, of democracy, of empowerment. How do we stakeholder loyalty into these economic systems that we're trying to build so that they're resilient over time and all of the great work, creativity, and entrepreneurship that goes into creating them actually ends up with the type of economy that we were hoping to come out with at the end. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing from this panel. So I'm going to introduce our panel, and we really are very lucky to have um, all of our panelists here today. There are folks in our local community who are going to share their experience, share what they're doing to ensure that local food jobs are good jobs. Um, they're coming from different perspectives, they work in different sectors of the food system, and um, and I think it'll be really, really interesting to hear what they've been working on and both what's been working for them uh, and some challenges that they've been facing in this process. So we're going to hear from each of them one at a time. And then after each of them has had a chance to present, we're going to open it up for questions from you all. And if you have also questions at that time for either of our keynotes, Alex or Urban, you can ask them then as well. So I'm going to briefly introduce all of them, and then they're going to come up one at a time to share their experience and work with you. So our first panelist is Dave Jackson from Enterprise Farm. Our second, <laughs> yeah, a little clapping doesn't hurt, that's nice. Um, our second panelist is Orbello Ramirez, who works with Dave at Enterprise and is also a member of Just Communities, which is an immigration reform um, organization here in the Valley. And um, Bliss, 
Requitrouts. I've been really working on that name for the last two minutes and it didn't come out right. Um, she's an organizer with Just Communities and she's going to be interpreting for Otovelio. Then, um, yeah, give her a hand. It's not an easy job and she's doing it all by herself today. So we really, I really want to recognize Bliss for all the work she's doing. Um, Annie Alred, who uh, works at the River Valley Market and is a union steward there. Steward there. And then Glenmore Buchanan, who uh, is from the Pioneer Valley New England Growers Co-op. And Rebecca Hamlin from Valley Green Digs, which is a worker co-op here in the Valley. So Dave is going to kick it off. And um, yeah, welcome him. Let's see if we can get this right. Everybody hear me? Yeah. Cool. Dave Jackson, Enterprise Farm. Our farm is based up in Waitley, uh, right on the banks of the beautiful Connecticut River. We, along with my family and staff, run about a 100 acre vegetable operation, which in the grand scheme of things is not a huge farm, but it's big enough that I feel like I can come here and speak to you guys on a nuts and bolts basis about labor profiles and the different labor groups and types of people who work on the farm. Sam really wanted me to touch on the mechanics and I also want to kind of bring up some of the issues that each of the different groups that work on the farm or types of workers that we have. So, speak up? Yeah. All right, sorry. This should be easy, but talking about farm work, farm labor, immigration reform, and all the issues that farmers, I am a farmer, have to kind of go through to figure out how to run their operations. It's going to be a challenge in six minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, before I get started, the first thing I really want to emphasize, too loud? Not loud enough? Feedback. Feedback. Like going back to the 60s. Um, the first thing I want to emphasize is Farm work is not unskilled labor. I think a lot of people feel like, oh yeah, does anybody can go out and pick a bunch of kale or drive a tractor, and it's certainly not true. The big challenge for a farmer, or any farm operation is, how do you build experience into an equation when you're dealing with seasonal labor, which rolls over all the time? So that is a big issue going forward, because you can't just hire new people all the time and expect to maintain your operation. Knowing that, the first group of people we have working on the farm is our, what we call our local health, and that is predominantly made up of young people probably between the ages of 18 and 26 who are coming into agriculture today with a real sincere interest in farming as a vocation. It's no longer seen as a prison sentence, but a real profession, which is a great thing compared to a number of years ago. However, this young group of people really, in many ways, lack a lot of work skill experience, having gotten out of college, and not really understanding all the complexities and hard work that go into running a farm operation. But generally, when we bring young people in and try to bring them up to speed, we'll use them in terms of doing things like farmers markets, working on packing CSA boxes, greenhouse work, and a little bit of field work. But as far as the bigger production piece, we find that uh, the more skilled and experienced workers will be out doing the harvesting and tractor work and all that kind of stuff. So, first piece is your local help. Second big piece, and I think big piece of what being looked at here today is what we call migrant workers or seasonal workers. We are, at Enterprise have a crew that comes up every year from Florida, somewhere between 10 or 12 guys, some of who have been with us since the beginning, about 10 years ago, and others who come with them as others leave to go back home. The seasonal workers probably present the biggest challenge for immigration reform going forward because they come with a lot of barriers. We have literacy, we have language skills, we have 
the whole computer age upon us, where computer literacy is another big issue, and then there's driver's licenses, which is a big issue going forward with many of the compliance issues that the farm faces today. So we have our seasonal workers. The last piece of the puzzle, which is also a big and complex piece, and I'm literally on the phone right now trying to resolve, we are part of the guest worker program, the H2A worker program, which I'm not sure how many people know about. I see a lot of guys from Jamaica working in the farm. They're it's around here. They're part of the H2A program. But it's not specifically Jamaican, it can be Mexican, people from all over the Caribbean. The guest worker program is really outdated, really archaic. The paperwork is ridiculously long and complicated. But it brings one benefit that we get a return group of guys pretty much every year. And the wage that the HUA program requires at the farm is definitely a much better wage than minimum wage because it's an average wage that's calculated from the national wage pool, not just New England. So the wage is going to be pushing 12 bucks an hour this year, which is not great pay, but it's certainly a lot better than the minimum. So those three pieces in place. We also have a year-round staff. One of the great things that the local movement has brought to the valley is an opportunity for farms like us to operate year-round. And the labor pool that we use for that is actually a combination of all three. So currently on the farm, we have employed eight people throughout the course of the season. The winter season to pack for our winter CSA program. That includes two guys who work doing tractor work for me, continue to maintain all the equipment. We have three people who work in the office to run the CSA, which is a very legitimate part of the agricultural profession. And then Cookie will speak next, and a couple other local people who've stayed on. So that is, uh, with 30 seconds left, the kind of nuts and bolts of a farm and some of the issues. Immigration reform has gone nowhere for the last 10 years. We've been waiting and waiting. So we'll be curious to see where it goes from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Next we have Orvelio Ramirez. Thank you. Hola, mucho gusto por estar acá. Es un gusto para mí poder hablar entre ustedes hoy. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, sharing my thoughts. Uh, voy a empezar a contar un poco de mi historia sobre por qué estoy acá, los, los motivos que me hizo venir a este país como inmigrante. As an immigrant worker, I'm going to start my story today by talking with you about why I came here to this country. Uh, es lindo estar acá en este país, pero más sin embargo, los retos que nos presentamos para llegar a este lugar es algo difícil. It's, uh, it's a blessing to be in this country, but the challenges that we go through to get here are something very difficult. Uh, lo difícil es tener que caminar tres días con galones de agua encima y andar con ese miedo de, de que ya no poder volver a ver la familia porque uno nunca sabe qué es lo que le pueda pasar en el camino. So it's a three day walk carrying your gallons of water with you to come to this country. Every moment with that fear of not knowing what's going to happen to you in that desert, uh, if you're going to be able to arrive, if you're ever going to see your family again. Pero lo bueno que llegamos a este punto, llegamos hasta este país con las ganas de, de seguir adelante, de apoyar a la familia económicamente, porque pues la familia, la economía en México es mala. Luckily, um, myself and others, we have been able to come to this country, we have made that journey to be able to support ourselves and support our families because of the bad economic situation in Mexico. Porque yo creo que como cualquier persona, todos deseamos un futuro mejor, un futuro donde uno le pueda brindar algo mejor a la familia, mejor a uno, mejor en el futuro. I feel like I'm the same as any other person, that I'm here looking for a better future for myself, for my family, and to have improved opportunities. Uh, bueno, 
ahora voy a hablar sobre lo que es este de la finca, mi trabajo, eh, sentir, con, sentirse conforme uno mismo en este país. So, now I would like to talk with you about my experiences uh, as a farm worker in this country. Pues es algo lindo, uno lo siente como si fuera su segundo hogar, porque pasa el tiempo completo uno en el trabajo, sentirse con la, con la amabilidad de, del, del patrón, de sentirse que al menos no, todo, no hay gente racista, no hay tanta gente racista de que habemos mucho que no nos echan al lado. So in Enterprise Farms, I, I feel like the farm is my second home. Um, because there are such good people that I'm working with. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with folks who aren't quite so racist. Um, and I don't know. Ya se te olvidó. Bueno, uh, es algo lindo con, convivir con, con gente como lo que son este, americanos, jamaquinos, guatemaltecos. Es algo bueno porque pues, se ve que gente unida y convivir día a día uh, por el trabajo. Uh, It's something beautiful actually to be working in shared culture with folks who are Americans from this country, with Jamaican workers, other immigrant workers, for us to all live together, and, or not live together, but work together. Um, and Have, be working for shared goals and have pleasant experiences. Y más que y más que nada uno se siente este contento porque pues no lo tratan mal a uno a pesar de donde somos de color que seamos y todo eso es algo lindo. And it's something really special to not be treated differently or not be treated badly for being a person of color. Y uno se siente con con esa confianza de que uno puede trabajar justamente porque en muchos casos y en muchos lugares ha habido mucho racismo de que los mismos patrones tratan como peones a sus trabajadores. And it's been uh, it's been a really great opportunity for me because I have seen in so many other places how workers are being treated as less than are being treated as <clears throat> more like slave workers than anything by their abusive bosses. Y pues por eso le quiero dar también las gracias a, a lo que es Day, de que pues abrió las puertas de la finca para poder trabajar ahí en ese lugar y, y ofrecerme un futuro mejor. And so to that end, I would like to say thank you to Dave for opening his doors to me and providing me that opportunity to work here with him and have that better opportunity. Uh, y más que nada, pues la experiencia que ha sido trabajar en el campo cómo cultivar las verduras de acá y todo eso, contribuir con la economía, cómo la gente inmigrante contribuye con la economía de Estados Unidos y trabajando en fincas y todo eso, pues es una, motiv una motivación grande. It's also a great motivation to see how the immigrant community is contributing to this country working in farms. Uh, Ah, bueno, ahora voy a cambiar este, de otro punto lo que es este, sobre lo que es el programa de comunidades justas. La organización de comunidades justas uh, se enfoca más que nada en defender a la, a la gente inmigrante, a la familia inmigrante. Just Communities es una organización Uh, focused on supporting and defending immigrant families. Y hacer un cambio en restaurar a la comunidad latina. And an or it's an organization that's working to make a positive change for the Latino community. En nuestras vidas como trabajadores, inmigrantes. In our lives as immigrant workers. Y pues más que nada nos estamos enfocando también en sobre que son y las licencias de conducir. One of the main goals for us as an organization is obtaining driver's licenses for immigrant workers. Buscamos la manera de, de, aliar, de aliarnos con las fincas, de conseguir firmas. Por ahora llevamos alrededor de 60 firmas 
para apoyar lo que es un paso muy grande a la licencia de conducir. At this point, we've been able to secure support from almost 60 farms who are supporting us in the shared objective of getting driver's licenses for immigrant workers. Y más que nada, pues, ¿cómo le, cómo le afectan a muchas personas que a los inmigrantes no tengan licencia, por lo menos en las fincas, de que muchos patrones quisieran este, dar de conducir a los carros a uno, pero pues ellos también tienen el temor de por la policía de que uno lo pare y no tener licencia. And lack of licenses, driver's licenses for immigrant workers is a shared problem in the farms um, because uh, bosses will want to ask their workers to drive food somewhere. They'll have the same fear that we have every day of having something happen on the roads or, or coming into some issue for not having a driver's license. Y más que nada nos enfocamos en eso por lo mismo de que pues uno quiere andar seguro en la calle sin miedo, sin miedo de que uno lo pare el policía y poder ser arrestado. For, for us as immigrants, licenses signify safety and freedom so that we will be able to move through the streets of Massachusetts without that fear that we're going to be stopped, we're going to be arrested, we're going to be harassed. Uh, y ahora lo que se está mostrando ahí en la pantalla es como pidiéndoles un favor de que para que mandes un mensaje de texto para apoyar sobre las licencias. So we'd like to ask all of you right now to take a second and take an action step in support of driver's licenses by texting licenses to 413-306-3483 as a form of text signing on to our petition for driver's licenses. Uh, y pues más que nada a todos los, los finqueros que están acá, los dueños de finca, los trabajadores de finca que, las, que estamos recolectando las firmas, pues les pido favor si ustedes pueden lo que es este apoyarnos con, con más firmas para dar un paso más grande aún. And I have a special request to anyone here who is a farmer or who is representing a farm that you take a second today to formally sign your business on in support of the Safe Driving Act so that we can count with your support in this fight. Y pues nos estarían apoyando, nos estarían apoyando en todo este paso que hemos dado porque pues es grande y todo lleva tiempo para, para hacer eso y pues ¿Qué persona inmigrante no quiere una reforma? Yo creo que todos. And we'll be really grateful for your signing on uh, and standing with us because it is a long fight and what immigrant doesn't want to see immigration reform in this country? Um, our next presenter is Annie Allred, uh, who's a union steward with UFCW at River Valley Market. My name is Annie Allred. Um, I work at River Valley Market as a produce assistant and also a UFCW union steward. Um, I've asked to share some of our experiences as workers, why we unionized and how that's making a good job, a better job. Um, so really just like disliking public speaking. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, for me, the co-op is about the community, fresh local food, and specifically produce, fresh food, local farmers, and conveying that story to our customers and providing fresh local food. Um, it's an awesome thing, and it's it's the circle. It's what makes um, stronger communities. Um, I started at River Valley in April of 2008, almost six years ago, when the store was empty, empty shelves. Um, I saw firsthand all of the work that goes into a new store. It's very much like recreating a wheel, but over the years it's been a difficult but an amazing journey. When I first started, we had a new employee orientation at the old Pleasant Street Theater. We had about 60 employees um, excited to be part of this new store that finally come to the area. We were given the promise of a different place of employment, one that valued the local food system, had a triple bottom line, where workers mattered and had a say in shaping their workplace. 
From the early days, workers began to encounter reoccurring problems. Um, communication has been a key issue. Too often one way with minimal two-way dialogue. Um, this directly contributed to the lack of information for workers. And this was a big challenge because as co-op people, we're all about information, especially when it pertains to our working environment. Uh, there were also unclear procedures and policies that were matched with arbitrary enforcement. These all fostered an environment where workers felt that they could not safely have their voices heard. Please don't get me wrong, uh, the working conditions have been good at River Valley, but they could be so much better. In the fall of 2011, we began off-site worker meetings to create positive change in the workplace. From there, we soon saw the need for UFCW as a valuable partnership and a means to address worker issues. Uh, February 10th, 2012, we had a car check and gained union recognition. Our first union contract was signed July 29, 2013, and was a huge success for workers. Um, through the unionization process, we utilize interest-based bargaining as a tool to work towards mutual benefit, basically sitting down uh, union stewards representing the workers and management, and sitting down talking through the issues to come to a common agreement for the better good of all. Um, our contract brought River Valley workers just cause, where management must have just cause for discipline and termination. Uh, we also gain seniority. Um, it affects shift preferences and schedules for workers. It allows us to have a life outside of work, and it also is a good means to retain workers. We gain Weingarten rights, uh, the right to union representation in disciplinary meetings with a supervisor. Uh, we also have clear protocol about disciplinary procedures and equitable enforcement. We now have a grievance procedure where decisions or possible contract violations can be challenged and resolved. Uh, we also created a labor management committee where staff issues are raised by union stewards and discussed with management to improve the working conditions and hopefully making it closer to the ideals of a progressive workplace. Um, along the way, we've had some challenges. Uh, one of those is building a new relationship with the union and management, and we are working on building trust and improving open communication. Oddly enough, these meetings, uh, the labor management meetings have been challenging. Uh, too often, agreeing to disagree on key issues and unable to work towards a compromise. But regardless, we've got the monthly opportunity to sit down and bring up the issues at hand. Um, very much a work in progress, but in a positive direction. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for change and improvement. Um, one is the momentum from the livable wage. Um, I feel that it is a key to becoming a progressive place of employment. It improves the conditions of pay for workers and allows us to thrive and to also contribute to the community and to participate in the local food system that we are all creating. Uh, news of the unionization at River Valley has led the way for Franklin County Co-op as well as Brattleboro Co-op to unionize, improving the working conditions and giving a voice to workers there. The growing movement of co-op unionization is creating more union jobs, which is an awesome thing. Uh, but it also points to larger issues of organizational structure of the workplace. Uh, the hierarchy structure and organization of the business is not always conducive to collective decision making and worker involvement. Uh, the co-op structure with its policy of governance keeps the board and store operations, also the workers and the member owners very separate with little actual communication. Um, we also have a lack of worker representation on the board, which some workers feel is problematic. Despite that, the co-op model allows for member owners to have a voice where they can show their support for the workers and for the union and to help make River Valley a progressive co-op in all matters. We as workers hope to better communicate our issues and to build stronger relationships with management, the board, member owners, creating a better, a better community, connecting everybody, 
and building the local food system that we're all striving towards. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. And next we're going to hear from Glenroy Buchanan. I definitely was dreading that. I know he was going to call my name next. Uh, um, basically, let me move this forward really quickly. One of the things I want to talk about is how we got together to do what we're doing right now in terms of farming on a very small scale that we exist. Um, there was no formal meeting. There was no formal get-together. There was no letters sent out. Um, I was living on East Street at the Dem Dem Farm. And, um, used to help with pick corn and do all sort of things, pick, pick, butternut, squash. And usually in the evening when we finished working, a lot of the guys would just sit around in what we call the, the, the garage. And we use a term we call reasoning, just talking, but we use the term reasoning. And um, what happens is a lot of the guys who come to work here, some of them enter the United States as, as early as our late February, early March, and a lot of them are here until after Thanksgiving, and so a lot of them, like other people, get homesick. They get homesick for not seeing their kids, their wives, their families, and we were actually just talking about some of the things that they miss eating in the, in the country that they were from, some of the foods that they met, they, they would like to eat when you're here. And so we started to talk about maybe putting a garden together and growing some of those things, one being uh, a green by the name of Kalaloo. And, um, so from that, we, we figured that might be a start, and we wanted to grow some pumpkins. So the other part was to have land. Now some people say, how can you have a co-op and you don't own any tractors, you don't have any plows, you don't own any farmland? Well, we don't. And my response to people a lot of times would be to say, well, let me give you an idea or an example. I said, you would stand a better chance of going into your refrigerator and grabbing a stick of frozen butter and throwing it and hitting the sun than you would to buy cheap land and have it. So, so what, we, what I was able to do, I kept asking these guys, uh, have any of them ever talked to the farmers that they work for? Did anyone ever go to the farm and say, hey, listen, can I use some of your land? The answer was always, no, man, these guys are not going to let us use their land. No, we're working for them, blah, blah, blah. Have you ever asked them? No response. So I decided to go to one of the farmers and say, listen, uh, we're looking for a piece of land to grow a few vegetables. And the farmer was like, oh man, that's no problem. How much do you need? You need a half an acre, quarter acre, two acres, three acres? I got a lot of land. Okay, good. So we started off on that kind of model, going to the farmers and asking them. And because a lot of these guys were already working for these farmers, they already knew, as, as, was, as you as, uh, mentioned before, they are unskilled labor. They're very, very skilled labor. They know how to drive every equipment on that farm. They know how to do everything. And so the farmers pointed out the land that, they, that we could use within proximity of where his fields were. So when they go out to plow his field as a part of their contract as laborers, they could easily make a U-turn and do the plowing on the land that he offered us. And so we started from that model. And so it's not, right now we're not a, um, on paper. We don't have like a, this, this contract of how we would work. We all sit down and decide what people want to grow. We try not to duplicate the same thing. And we also try to make sure that the things that we grow will fit into the communities that we're selling. So for instance, if I use Springfield or Mason Square as an example, Mason Square probably have one of the most diverse market in this area, or matter of fact, probably in, in Massachusetts, but they have, that market that we said they have, they have blacks, white, they have Hispanics, they have Puerto Ricans, Colombians, Mexicans, they have um, people from Ethiopia, Ghana, Uganda. It's a very diverse market. It's the only market that I've ever been to now, I've been to a lot of farmers market where when the market starts in the morning, the vendors and the customers get out from behind their stand and they do the line dance. You guys know that line dance that they do? And then we get down to business. It's really an interesting market. Uh, but the thing, as I, I said again, it's really important to understand that the people that come here to work, 
come here because they have a dream. And like most of us, I don't think anyone in this room, especially if you have kids or you have parents, older or younger, you want for them to get the best and no one really wants to see their kids growing up without shoes or clothes or being in a, or have object poverty. So a lot of people come here to do that work. And so I find them to be very skilled, they're very educated, they're very talented, and they're very motivated to not be become a liability to the country, but also to maintain a high standard of professionality. And so I'm a, a thousand percent supportive of them. And what I do is just a little fraction of what can be done, but we're moving forward. I'm moving forward trying to secure us a small piece of land that we can call our own. Maybe get a little small barn, maybe Maybe right now, maybe we might rent a horse as a tractor, but you know, who knows? We gotta start someplace, but the story is just a simple one that within this structure we have created, people are really galvanized around producing food that's available to everybody. And, and, and people who do it the most, or do it the best right now, as part of our food chain, are the people who come from different countries to work here to make sure we have a lot of stuff to eat. Thanks so much, Glenn. Next up is Rebecca Hamlin from Valley Green Beast. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Rebecca. I work with Valley Green Beast, which is a worker-owned cooperative. Um, I have been with them since I graduated college from UMass Amherst in 2010, so I'm coming up on almost four years. Um, and it has completely changed my life. Um, I don't even know where to start. I could talk about co-ops all day, so if any of you have time after this, you just want to like chit-chat. Um, so Valley Green Beast, our structure, we are a local food delivery service. So we've built relationships with some of the farms in this room, different producers like Real Pickles, Catalyst Kombucha, also co-ops. Um, and we kind of gather all their stuff together and bring it um, to people's homes. Um, so a really special part about Valley Green Feast and why I got involved with it originally is because of our structure. Um, a worker-owned cooperative is owned and operated equally by all of the owners, or the workers. So you can see that picture of the four of us up there. Um, we all own a 25% share in our business. We had a buy-in, um, and we all equally operate. It's non-hierarchical. Uh, we don't have any employees. We make all of our decisions using consensus. Sometimes it's difficult, but it's ultimately rewarding. Um, we provide space for people to bring themselves to the table, um, whether it's past experiences or challenges that they've had in their life or like a really strong opinion about whether or not we should you know, only source food or only source coffee from a co-op as opposed to a local business or something like that. So there's like lots of conversation, lots and lots that goes on um, at our meetings. Um, Valley Green Feeds was started back in 2008 as a sole proprietorship. Um, so one woman ran it by herself for a little while. I don't know how she did it, but I'm really glad she did. Um, and the reason why we were able to continue and why I'm here today is again because of our co-op model. Um, Jessica decided to transition her business into the co-op um, because she needed to step back. And something that we don't see enough in, I think, the agricultural movement is succession planning and creating longevity, um, making sure that your business is going to continue even if you're not there. Um, and I think that cooperatives are a real testament to that. Um, Jessica was able to put in what she could to the business and knew when it was right for her to step back. Um, and that's happened over the course of the time that I've been there. People have been there, they've given what they can, they have these experiences, but at a certain time, they may need to transition onto something else. Um, and because we're a co-op, it's not gonna stop moving. Um, we have you know, ways that we can train people, ways that we can you know, make sure that it continues, even if um, I'm not there or something like that. Um, so it's super important and something I think that we should be continuing to work on in the movement as a whole. Um, we have a division of labor, so we all have our own areas of expertise, um, and we trust each other. I don't know that much about bookkeeping. I'm never gonna be a numbers person, but somebody in our group has a, um, a background in that, so that's where her skills come through, and I'm not going to challenge her necessarily about some 
things that fall under her category. So we really, we give each other a lot of leeway to make decisions within our own areas of expertise, but then we also work together on the ground. We're packing bags together, we're delivering together, and there's that face time where we're all doing the same job, but we all kind of have our own areas that we can excel in. Um, a really important part of our model is humanization of the workplace. Um, being for young women in the business world isn't easy. Um, it's not necessarily the hardest thing, um, but we have faced a lot of challenges, you know, being taken seriously, um, making sure that, you know, we are strong business leaders and not just being seen as, oh, that's cute, like, look at that, we're running a business, it's not fun. Um, <laughs> the mean of our ages is like 28 years old or something, so we're relatively young in the business world, but we all have a lot of experiences. I've been working in cooperatives for five years. So it's a little chunk of time. Um, so going off that humanization is, uh, this past year, one of our worker owners became a mother. That's a huge life change. It's also a huge change for business. Um, and we were able to come together and make that happen for her. A lot of women, um, you might not see coming back to their jobs after they've left for maternity leave. Um, and then that wealth of knowledge is gone and you know they've moved on to this other part of their life, which is so beautiful. But we really wanted to create an infrastructure where Becky could become a mother and we could be there to support her. Um, this has been a huge year for us. We expanded into Boston through a collaboration with another worker co-op that does our deliveries out there by bicycle. Uh, so we've been meeting, you know, 100 times more than we usually do. There's been unpaid hours. We've been putting in sweat equity. And all throughout that, there's been a crying baby at the meeting, or Becky is talking to us about finances, and she's also changing a diaper. Um, and it's just like, there's been a lot going on, but we've created an environment where she can do that. Um, and that's really important to us. Um, another really important thing or, you know, difficult challenges has been, you know, creating a job that has a living wage and making sure that we're investing in something that we really believe in. Um, it may not be something that, you know, I'm not making as much money had I continued on the track of becoming a physical therapist, which is what I thought I wanted to do before I learned about co-ops. Am I happier? Absolutely. I am empowered. I have a say. I can work with these other women and we can make a difference in the business world, in the agricultural world, and in this movement as a whole. And it's because of our ties to other businesses and the co-op community as a whole. Um, we work with 10 different cooperatives. Um, it's a really amazing network to have and to be able to work with. And I think that even though we're putting in a lot of hours to invest in a business that is gonna grow and be there even when we're not there, um, Again, that sweat equity is going into it, but I wouldn't change it for the world. Thank you all very much for sharing um, your really diverse experiences and perspectives around how to ensure that local food jobs are in fact good jobs. And now I want to open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions um, for any of the panelists. And also, if you have a question for either Urban or Alex, you're welcome to ask it now. Hey Dave, can you spend a couple minutes talking about the produce bus um, that you're doing at Enterprise Farm? Um, Enterprise Farm, I don't know, this will be year four, um, runs a mobile market that we do down in Springfield. It's part of an offshoot of the beauty of having a CSA farm. We have a little more control over our own destiny in terms of financial decisions we make because our members, kind of like co-op, invest in us ahead of schedule. But the whole premise of the mobile market is trying to tackle the whole struggle with food hardship and food access that exists in even our beautiful little valley. You know, as a grower for 25 years, we primarily sold in Franklin, New Hampshire County, in Boston, New York, stuff went to LA, London, who knows. But we had never really sold that much in Hamden County, and we got this idea from a group that we worked with down in South Carolina about being able to take a fully equipped bus, like a farmer's market, and be able to drive it around. And this is year four. We will be doing three bus routes this year. So the thing has really grown, and uh, we really couldn't have done it without our partnership with uh, Livewell Springfield. But Great thing. 
Thank you. I just wanted to follow up, Dave. Are you looking for other markets for that mobile market? The goal is to grow it out so that the bus travels throughout the valley at least six days a week. At this point, we're kind of changing the nature of how we do what we do. We're trying to transition it so that the project itself can get embedded in Springfield and be run by people who are looking for work in Springfield. And we as a farm, kind of like Glenroy said, can focus on producing crops that people in these areas really want. Primarily as an organic farm, we grow a lot of lettuce, kale, collard, and char. But the amazing part of what we've learned is that people are really looking for a lot of different kinds of products, and we'd be happy to learn how to grow them. We know cow, but that's a great one. So the model will expand, and there's opportunity there. So if you wanted to check in with us, we can talk to you about it. Hello, my question is for Over Leo. I'm wondering if you get a chance to go home again in the winter, if, if you have to go back and forth, uh, or, uh, or live, you know, just uh, displaced from, from home for most of the year. Ah, pues, tengo que vivir todo el año sin la conexión de mi familia, porque, pues, es difícil volver a ir a México y volver. Es fácil ir a México, pero es difícil volver a regresar otra vez a este país. Unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to go home and be with my family. I have to be here all year long because it's very easy to go down to Mexico, but it's not easy to get back here. My question is also for Orvego and for Bliss. Um, when I hear his story, I'm really struck by the parallels to black farmers in the South in particular who um, were locked into what we would call sharecropping um, experiences, but they were really more like indentured servitude. And as they tried to move away from that and establish their own small farms, you know, they would experience some of the same um, types of harassment. You know, it wasn't a, in a legal form, but it would be racist people coming in trucks um, to stop them as they're walking home or driving home from the farms. So I see a real place of opportunity for building alliances with folks having those experiences, because to me, they're the same. Um, they just come in a uniformed version here. And so I just wonder what, if he feels that, if he shares that same thoughts, or if they've been able to build any um, connections. Sí, eh, es algo lindo compartir con esas personas y ver que hace muchos, hace años atrás era diferente y pues los tiempos cambian. Ahora el racismo ya no es tanto como antes y es algo bueno porque se ve de que año en año las cosas pueden ir cambiando a un bien, no a mal. So it's it's something beautiful to have seen in the last couple of years. This is that relationship forming and experiences with racism shifting or the the climate of racism shifting. Sí, uh, pues sí, yo he trabajado siempre así como lo que son con jamaiquinos y todo, y pues es algo bien, nos llevamos bien, ver que también a pesar del trabajo también crece una amistad, <coughs> perdón, <coughs> que crece una amistad con, con gente que, que uno conoce que es de otro país. So, through farm work, I have had the opportunity to connect with um, mostly Jamaican farm workers uh, or other farm workers of color and build those relationships that are the basis of that. Um, so also as an organization, we're looking at different ways. In, in many ways, the immigrant rights movement in this state and in this country is very divided and oftentimes immigration reform, whether it's a state reform like driver's licenses that we're working for here or a national reform, in many ways it's become focused on Latino immigrants and oftentimes African immigrants and Asian immigrants or South Asian immigrants are cut out of that conversation or sort of sidelined in that conversation. And so something that we're working on building up in this area is how we are going to overcome the barriers that exist everywhere but that are also very much in existence here um, when we're talking about language barriers, when we're talking about uh, racial stereotyping, limited experiences with people from uh, people from other races or other cultures that 
are um, bound up into limited experiences that happen at work or an experience that happens with a cop or um, just very brief moments, how we're really confronting the fact that there are large histories of racism between communities of color and how we can be building with black African uh, immigrant communities or Jamaican immigrant communities in Western Mass because although we don't have a membership of Jamaican immigrants, we know that folks who come with work visas don't necessarily go home for the same reasons that folks come without visas in the first place. And mostly the place that we're seeing those workers or those folks right now are in detention centers. And we haven't found that community, where that community, because so many undocumented communities are really underground communities, we haven't made that strong connection with that underground community outside of the detention center. And so that's actually something that we're doing strategic planning on at this point as an organization, how we're able to connect um, specifically the large population of Jamaican farm workers who come, who probably are not always going home, how we're able to overcome language, how we're able to overcome any stereotypes or institutionalized uh, ideas about oppression that exist between those communities, so that we're not just being seen as a Latino-only fight, but we're also working with other groups. We probably have time for one more question, so. Um, encouraging ex-inmates to get training and connection with good, good jobs. Yeah, I don't think that anybody on the panel has direct experience with that. Although, I would, if somebody in the room does and want to say a few words about that, I would be, I would welcome that. I, I don't have direct experience, but you could contact Julie Rawson at Many Hands Organic Farm in Barrie. They've been doing this for a number of years um, and um, have a lot of dedication to that uh, program. Thank you. And I think Dave wants to say a few words about that as well. Well, I can speak to it a little bit with the H2A farm worker program that we use. It's obviously there to fill jobs if you can't find people locally. But the way that program works is we post job orders through the whole system that are posted all the way to California. So anybody with any kind of experience doesn't have to be you know, years and years is eligible for those jobs as long as they know where to look and find them. So that might be one avenue to look into. There are a few prisons in Massachusetts that have either um, maintained their traditional farming program or are newly starting them. And there was a very um, exciting project where we have a school system in Eastern Mass which is buying beef from a prison nearby. And it had been a dairy farm on the prison and they converted to raising beef and they were able to sell the beef to the school at a lower price because obviously they're not paying the prisoners very much, but we began to see where you might be able to really begin to have training programs in the jails, a lot of them still have a lot of land, and so you might be able to come out of jail already knowing uh, some of the skilled labor needed for either vegetable production or for meat production. So that's something we could work towards in the future. We could have a day-long workshop um, on any one of the issues raised by the panelists here today or raised by the keynotes. Um, but what we, what we try to do here is provide a breadth of um, things that are happening in our community and possibilities for engaging this question of how do we create good food jobs in the Pioneer Valley. And we're going to have an opportunity to go more into depth in the small breakout groups with resource people that are coming up. So, um, so yeah, I just want to thank all of our panelists. And thank you all for being here, and um, we're going to move on. So I'm going to invite Christina Maxwell up from the Food Bank Farm, who's going to lead us into the small group breakouts. Hi, everyone.
everybody. I'm Christina Maxwell. I'm from the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, and I'm really pleased to be here today um, to listen to this really fascinating conversation. So I want to encourage you to pay very close attention for the next few minutes, because what we're going to do is set up like the next hour and a half worth of activity. And then after that, you'll have an opportunity to get up, stretch your legs, get coffee, water, use the restroom, whatever. So just hang in for a little while more, um, and then we'll have a chance to move around. So um, what we're going to do now is move into small groups. And each of those groups is going to have a little bit of a focus area and is going to have within it a facilitator and a few people that we're calling resource people. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit more how that's going to work. So first we're going to move into the groups which are going to be starting off around this room and then once the groups form you can decide if you want to move to another area of the building or go outside or sit down at a table or whatever you'd like to do. But for the moment we'll just be meeting around the perimeter of this room. Um, each group, as I said, is going to have a facilitator and resource people. The facilitator is simply going to encourage everybody in that group to introduce themselves so that you know who's there with you, and they'll introduce the resource people, who are folks who are working in the topic area which is being addressed in that particular group. Some of them are the panelists that we heard from earlier. Some of them are others of us who are in the room right now. Now, it's important to understand that those resource people are not providing presentations. So in some past years at forums, we've broken down and there have been small uh, presentations, and that's not really what we're doing here. This is more of an opportunity for people to talk with each other, maybe make connections with people who share an interest or have a similar question that you might have, and it's a time for you to network and talk amongst each other. So there won't be any formal presentations. But the resource people are there to answer questions or maybe ask some questions um, and provide some information in that context. So what I'm going to do now is ask the resource people to come up. That's going to be quite a group. Um, if you can come up, we're going to go through each group and they're going to very briefly introduce themselves and the topic that they'll be talking about and then identify where in the room they will be meeting. So um, we've got eight groups. Uh, so you should listen to each of the groups and kind of figure out which one you'd like to go to. So if all the resource people could come up to the front right now, that would be great. Okay, so I'm going to start off with, um, these are listed on your program, by the way. We're going to talk for a moment about worker cooperatives. And we've come up with a few questions, and these are strictly meant as sort of context setting, maybe get the juices flowing a little bit. You might have other questions that you would prefer to ask and talk about, and that's terrific. These are merely just questions that the planning group thought of. So the first one for worker cooperatives is, in what ways do worker-owned co-ops address economic and equity issues for local food system workers? Okay, so it looks like this group is going to meet at the first orange flag right over in the corner here. Um, I'm Addie Rose Holland from Real Pickles, so um, I will have some things to say about Real Pickles. And we're a worker owned cooperative. Kind of know my deal already. Um, I work with a lot of different co op organizations, so I'll be able to tie in a broader perspective and focusing in on the worker co op angle. The next group is going to discuss immigrant reform, and the question we've got is how can local food businesses be allies to immigrant workers in the local food system? Why is immigration reform important to local food businesses, farm workers, and our communities at large? Hi, I'm Bliss Reckwitrots. I'm an organizer with Just Communities, and um, I think one of the points that we would like to make today is, is to open that conversation to the ways that farms and the local sustainable agriculture really does have a, a shared issue and potential shared benefits by working on local uh, immigration reforms in the state of Massachusetts, and be happy to talk about 
some of the national themes as well, but looking at Massachusetts as an area where we have capacity to make some uh, systemic change. Okay, our third group is going to discuss restaurant worker organizing. And the question here is, what is the state, the current state of working conditions for restaurant workers in Northampton? What can food service businesses prioritizing sourcing local food learn about creating fair wage jobs? Hi, um, I'm Claire Hammonds. I work at the UMass Amherst Labor Center. And we're going to be talking a little bit about some research we've been doing, um, looking really at the other end of the food chain in terms of looking at the people who actually serve our food um, and trying to think about what some of the, the connections are to really bring good jobs to them. And hello, my name is Rose Bookbinder. I'm an organizer with Western Mass Jobs with Justice and the newly launched um, Pioneer Valley Worker Center where we're exploring um, some of these larger issues in terms of the whole food system, but specifically, as Claire mentioned, um, this research that we've explored, and this is sort of our first um, conference where we're gonna be announcing some of the results from that research, so thanks for having us here. And they'll be over at the third orange sign that's sort of in the middle of that side of the room. Let me get out of the spotlight here. Okay, so our next topic will be job training. What are the important considerations in training local food system workers? Hi, I'm Christine Burns, and I'm the Director of Development at Providence Ministries, and I'm here representing FoodWorks, and it's a culinary training program for men and women with barriers to employment, um, and that's a lot of different barriers, uh, and we'll be talking more about that. Hello, I'm Ryan Carr, I work for Many Hands Farm Corps. We have a uh, pretty intensive but also extensive impact of a, an internship that helps provide labor for over a dozen farms in the valley and we work with a lot of people who have never worked on farms before so dealing with a lot of basic needs for people who have never done it before. Okay, great. Our next group is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, that group is going to be back where Abby is standing and pointing because evidently we don't have enough bamboo poles. So thanks, Abby. <laughs> Okay, our next group is going to be discussing local food union jobs. What role can unions play in local food system work and the viability of the local food system businesses? Hi, uh, my name is Brendan Carey and I'm the lead organizer with uh, Unite Here, the New England Joint Board. And so we're gonna talk about a few recent local victories in unionizing different college cafeterias and uh, also about, you know, as we start to, you know, bring more local food and do a lot more food preparation in the kitchen, um, you know, how to keep those jobs good jobs and not just have that equal more work for the same pay and, and you know, really make these jobs really good, sustainable jobs. Hi, I'm Annie Allred, uh, union steward for UFCW. I'm happy to answer questions and to share experience from our unionization process. Thanks, and that group will be in the far back corner on this side of the room. Our next group is going to be community-based food job creation. What options do communities have for local food system job creation? Um, so I'm Emily Cuano, and Fred Rose is here too. We're with a Wellspring Cooperative um, Initiative. We're, uh, we're working to create a network of worker-owned businesses in Springfield. Um, and what the business that's in the pipeline is a hydroponic greenhouse. Um, Urban Kroll again. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how food co-ops have used their buying power to basically help new businesses get off the ground and grow, as well as some of the areas we're seeing for growth in food co-ops and the jobs within those co-ops. I'm Alex Risley Schroeder with the Mass Workforce Alliance, and we're a workforce development group that realized that in order to actually have jobs for folks to fill, we had to lean in and help create them. So we'll talk about that perspective. Okay, and that group is going to meet also in the back corner. Okay, our next group is youth jobs. What is unique about engaging youth in local food system work? My name is Andy Grant. I do outreach for Just Roots. We're a nonprofit serving Franklin County, uh, concerned with increasing access to healthy local food. 
Um, the Greenfield Community Farm is the centerpiece of our work, and on the farm we have apprentices and interns. Uh, this year we're offering six intern slots, unpaid college credit intern positions. So we'd be happy to talk about that. Hello, I'm Donna Dussel. I work for the Franklin Hampshire Regional Employment Board, and I am the School to Career Coordinator for Franklin County. I also do work in uh, Hampshire County in the North Quabbin. Um, and I am interested in youth unemployment, which is at a very high uh, rate right now, and the impact that that has on um, the future of um, these youth and also on our society. So I also am working with Just Roots, and we do have a high school internship program that happens there uh, over the summer. Um, we are interested in engaging youth in um, agricultural career pathways and food systems career pathways as it is a priority industry for the Regional Employment Board. And I'm also here to gather resources as well as be a resource as much as possible. Good morning, um, Ibrahim Ali, Youth and Project Director for Garden and the Community in Springfield, Massachusetts. We're an urban based uh, urban agriculture program uh, that's running, uh, that does a lot of work with youth. I think one of the issues that, that uh, I'd definitely like to speak on and, and talk about is the fact that we went from one extreme of youth doing extremely hard, difficult labor to now they're like almost untouchable. So, uh, you know, trying to figure out what is the best kind of medium between those two extremes uh, is something that I'm very interested in doing. And young people, particularly in Springfield, have a hard uh, issues around employment. So that's another issue that we could probably discuss. Thank you. Okay, and last but certainly not least, farm jobs and farm work. What makes up farm work and who are doing these jobs? How do you walk the line between producing quality food that is affordable while also creating jobs that are valued and respected? Uh, yes, that's what I'm be talking about, but also to, to inject some other things into the conversation that for people who are um, looking maybe for farm workers to help them harvest their crop or to help them put gardens together or to help them in a way that they would be looking for skilled laborers or people who are really versed in, in planting and agriculture, that that's another avenue that they can also be employed if you have groups or uh, families who want to start a backyard garden, these people would be willing to come over and help them start it for nominal fee of some kind. Okay, and that final group, um, hopefully Dave Jackson will be able to join, but he may need to leave, so it's not sure, but for sure Glenroy will be there, and that group will be meeting in that far back corner. So, in just a minute, not right yet, I'm going to have you get up, find the group that you're most interested in going to, the facilitators are going to lead you in a round of introductions, and then this is really open networking and discussion time for you. So either stay in the group that you originally went to, or if that conversation isn't working for you, go find another group that might fit your needs better. We're going to come back here together at 12.15 for some closing, and then after that we'll have lunch. All right, enjoy. Thank you.